Hey folks, I'm Will Brantley, editor of Realtree.com. Today we're going to get into hunting all phases of the rut. All right, so as we're starting to talk about hunting different phases of the rut, it's kind of important to define what, you know, what the rut is. We kind of, as deer hunters, we keep it in mind. It's this event and people always ask, you know, has the rut started yet? And, you know, the, the actual peak of the rut, the, the true, you know, breeding phase of the rut, when bucks are locked down with does, is, is, is a comparatively short time period of this activity that we're all hoping to capitalize uh, on as deer hunters. And so um, the timing of it is going to vary a bit depending on where you live. You know, there's areas in the deep south where the peak rut might not be till January. Um, where I am in southwestern Kentucky, northwest Tennessee, tends to be sort of late November that, uh, I don't know, middle of the month through Thanksgiving tends to be peak rut. But for most of the country, um, you know, we, we kind of, I, and for the purposes of, of talking about this, I'm going to break down these phases based on kind of what I call a, a Midwestern rut timing. That's sort of the classic rut timing. And that's where it falls for whitetails in most of the country. So as I, as I throw these dates for the, for the time frames around, just keep in mind that, you know, depending on where you are, the dates might not exactly match up, but the tactics are going to be pretty close, and the tactics are what we're here to talk about. So with that in mind, as we get into this, this first phase of the rut, uh, again, on that Midwestern rut timing, we're looking at the pre-rut. We're looking at about October 10th through the 22nd, and this is really when your, your early season patterns, your really bed-to-feed patterns are coming to an end, and things are really starting to change in the whitetail woods. You've got a few things going on. You've got uh, bachelor groups of bucks that have been together all summer long. Um, they're, they're breaking up now. Usually late September, 1st of October, they're, they're pretty well busted up. You've got some bucks that are shifting home ranges all together. Um, usually your more dominant bucks, if you've been seeing them in an area over the summer, a lot of times they're going to establish, you know, is, is kind of the kind of the king there in that in that given area. So there, that home range usually doesn't change a whole lot, but you know, that's there's always exceptions to every rule. But you're going to see some shifting of home ranges. You're also going to see some shifting in behaviors based on changing food sources. You know, by uh, you know, let's say your your archery season opens in early September, like mine does. Well, there's there's a lot of green stuff in the woods at that time. The soybeans are still green. There's a lot of green brows. Um, food plots are new and green, provided you've had the rain on them. Um, the corn hasn't been picked yet in, in most cases. And so deer are really concentrated, particularly on those soybean fields, things like that. But as the fall goes on, soybean fields yellow up, uh, corn fields are being picked, you've got acorns that are beginning to fall, you've got your fall uh, soft mass that's coming into play, and then you've got a lot of that summertime browse that's starting to go dormant for the fall and the winter. And so um, deer are shifting their home ranges not necessarily, uh, you know, due to a, to a big migration or a big fall movement or a, or a you know, a, a dominance thing, but they're, they're kind of shifting their daily patterns based on those changing food sources. And so probably the, the most important step for hunting the pre-rut successfully is staying on top of those food sources, you know, and that, again, that might be a good food plot. It might be a cut cornfield. My, my absolute favorite place to be in early October is over a cornfield that's just been cut. I don't think there's any better place to see a lot of deer at that time of year. But acorns are always going to be a big factor too. Now, um, you know, I know Josh, I've, I've, I've worked with Josh for a long time. Josh is a really good deer hunter. He's killed some awesome deer. Um, his year to year, you know, strategy differs a little bit from my own and that Josh is really good at picking out, you know, what, you know, what you've probably heard on hunting TV called a, a you know, a target buck. He likes to identify a, an individual deer and, and really put his time and, and focus on those individual deer. And I, I'll do that on occasion. Um, but you know, if I'm being honest, I've got a little itchier trigger, trigger finger. So when a nice buck comes out, I, I usually like to shoot, but this, this pre-rut time period, um, you know, as Josh illustrates in his article, is an especially good time. If you're on a particular buck, if you're on a, a pattern with a particular buck, a target buck, it's a really good time to move in and kill him. And definitely if I've got a deer that's a regular on trail camera that I'm watching a lot, I will, uh, you know, I'll try to put a lot of effort into moving in and killing that deer in the pre-rut. And a couple of things seem to really come together at that time of year that that make that that possible. You know, again, I mentioned those those change in food sources, which you know can can actually kind of help you narrow the search a little bit. If if a great big soybean field was all green and it's suddenly yellow or or been picked, 
Um, and then you've got one hot oak tree, you know, off from a cut cornfield or whatever it is, you can really pinpoint a deer's routine around that one good food source. And you might even be in a state where baiting is allowed and that can still really concentrate deer in a certain area. So if you're catching pictures of a, of a good buck around a food source, you know, maybe not in the, in shooting light, but maybe right after shooting light, like right at the edge, that's a deer that you can kill. So one of the, one of the best things that you can do is kind of it's kind of backtrack your way from the food source. Use your trail cameras to uh, to to kind of try to catch that deer's patterns in those transition areas between um, you know where you think he's bedding and where you think he's going to eat. And it might take a little trial and error to do that, um, but you can move those cameras around, put them on good trails, look for those those transition areas, particularly if they if they've got some acorns where it might cause a buck to stage up and cover, hit those acorns on his way out to a main uh, you know food source. That's where you can set up and kill that deer. I try to be pretty passive that time of year, and I know that's something that, that Josh is big on too. Um, don't hunt a lot of mornings um, in, in early October. Just the chances of, of running into that deer on your way to the stand as he's headed back to bed are just a little bit too high, and you've, you've got a lot of good morning hunting to come. You hate to burn one of your best spots um, by, by you know messing things up on a low odds hunt anyway. So, so hunt those evenings. Find those transition areas near the food sources. If you've got a good buck that's moving on the fringes of daylight, that's one that you can kill. That's, that's when it's time to move in and be a little bit aggressive. So um, as you're moving into the kind of the, the, the second period of the rut, you know, what you start kind of calling the, the seeking phase, um, that's going to be around October 23rd, October 25th to, to right around the 1st of November, basically that week of Halloween. And that's when things really start getting to be fun, you know, in the deer woods. That's when uh, uh, you get to, you see a lot of deer generally. You see a lot of little bucks, especially, that are getting up on their feet. Um, they're feeling their oats. They're, they're on the move. They're looking for a girlfriend. Uh, not that they're going to have much luck in getting one, but they're covering ground, and every now and then you can you can catch a big one uh, on his feet doing the same thing. But, but even so, this early seeking phase of the rut, that time right around Halloween, it's sort of like that pre-rut, uh, that, that pre-rut pattern amplified because what you get generally that time of year that that late October you start getting the first really good winter cold fronts of the year and those fronts are uh they're they're critical for you know like when you see that front in the forecast and you can kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together you know again just like you had during the pre-rut of you got a good buck on trail camera he seems to be moving in the edge of daylight. You know where he feeds. You've got a pretty good idea of where he beds. You've got a pretty good idea of the route that he's likely to take between feeding and bedding. Um, you know, maybe you're seeing some scrapes up in there. Maybe you know of a, of a good oak tree that's dropping acorns. Probably seeing some rubs up in that travel corridor. Basically, you're kind of getting dialed in on what you think is this buck's area. You watch the forecast, you get that first good winter front of the year, that, that front that, you know, that leaves you a good frost, it's got you a good northwest wind. That's when that deer is likely to be on his feet. And, you know, um, you can get in there and hunt that transition area. That is a time, actually, for, for evening hunts in particular. Uh, I personally like to back out. I, I like to sit right on a good food source on an evening hunt like that, particularly if you got that front blowing in, you got a little light rain. Um, it, it's, it's getting cold. Um, you're going to have those little bucks up cruising. And a lot of times those are the type evenings, even though the breeding's not happening yet, even though the bucks know that the does aren't receptive yet, been a lot of times that I've seen a big deer step out, you know, an hour before dark on an afternoon like that. So that's a really good time to be in the stand. But again, you still want to keep an eye on, on all those pieces of the puzzle, the food, the bedding area, um, the transition area and those good trail camera pictures. So, this next phase of the of the rut, definitely my favorite uh, as a bow hunter, um, and and it, it probably is most people's. It's the chasing phase of the rut, and this is the this is the phase when you have the very first does of the fall come into estrus, and uh, and they're receptive, and and those big bucks know it, and that's when you most of this this phase you you can you can tell it's 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 getting ready to happen. Um, a lot of times by just watching your food sources in the evenings. Um, around Halloween, you know, first of November, you're gonna start seeing the family groups of does um, that are coming out into those big fields every evening. All at once it's gonna seem like they vanish. And a lot of times you're gonna see the, the little fawns, the little button bucks. They're still gonna hit those fields, 
but it, they're they're kind of running solo because their mothers have kicked them away. And, that, and there's two things going on there. Those does are are getting ready for for the breeding you know the breeding season, but they're also um, they're getting harassed every evening. They they come out in these fields. The little bucks know that they're that they're out there. And they're just they, a doe can be if you if you watch you know a, a field full of deer at that time of year you know that those poor old does can barely you know get a bite before a spike or a four corn or something is is running them off and so when you start seeing the the absence of those mature does on those primary food sources where you've been seeing them all fall uh, that's a good indication that that chase phase and the and the peak breeding is just around the corner so. This is the time of year. Um, you definitely want to start hunting mornings. You can start being pretty aggressive. And this is the time of year when you want to, um, I kind of break down the strategies in one or two different ways. One, if you're not really dialed in on a particular pattern, you know, through your trail cameras or whatever, um, just set yourself up in a good traffic corridor, um, a good pinch point. It might be the edge of a thick fence row. It might be a neck down in a creek bottom. Uh, it might be a saddle up in the timber field edge corners you know there, there's a lot of different places where you you know it um you know if you've done any amount of deer hunting you know the areas where deer always walk and and hunting during the chase phase when a lot of deer are up on their feet is can really be just as simple as putting yourself in a spot where you know lots of deer walk because um the idea is just to funnel that traffic down to where you can get a shot and those bucks, because there's so much movement going on at that time of year, you're really just kind of playing the odds. You're parking yourself in a tree, you're putting in the hours, you're playing the odds to get those bucks in close to you. Now, um, I've got some props here on the table. There's several things that, that I start using really kind of kind of during the, during the late seeking phase and definitely getting into the chasing phase. So, you know, if I'm uh, kind of going in blind to an area, or let's say I'm scouting a new farm, one of the things that I like to do just to sort of see what's in the area at that time of year, because you've got a lot of bucks starting to cover ground, especially at night, covering new home ranges. I like to set out, uh, I like to make mock scrapes. There's, there's a, it's a great way to uh, put a lot of trail cameras in the area and get pictures quickly of potential bucks that you want to hunt. And so, um, you know, in the off season, outside of deer season, I'm a, I'm a big trapper. Um, and, and one of the things that, that the trap line has taught me there are a million different kinds of scents out there. Um, most of the time, the type of scent that you use doesn't really matter so much as the location that you that you put it in. And I, I definitely think the same is true with a uh, you know with a mock scrape. And so, I mean, this just happens to be a bottle of deer pee. You know, this is a doe estrus scent that that I grabbed. Um, I, I tend when I'm making my mock scrapes by default, I just sort of use doe estrus urine in them. Um, but I've used duck, uh, buck urine, I've used tarsal gland. I don't think the scent really matters so much as putting that mock scrape in the right place and more importantly, the right kind of licking branch. Because if you watch deer any amount of time, you can see deer during turkey season using a go-to licking branch that they're going to use all year long. And that's, that's the thing that's important. So identify those good springy green licking branches. Put your mock scrapes in areas where deer are going to travel, where there's a lot of good sign um, good pads, you know, things, you know, places where deer are going to be, be anyway. And if they're running into that mock scrape and getting that, that nose full of scent, really, whether it's doe and estrus, whether it's, you know, it's buck tarsal, really whatever it is, they're going to come check it out. You're not going to scare a deer off by using the wrong scent at the wrong time of the season. That's just not something that I believe. So that's a good way monitor your, your mock scrapes um, and, and certainly put cameras over real scrapes too. That's a good way to know what's in the area as you begin those those all-day sits, those all-day vigils, and you're just kind of, you know, hunting the rut is kind of a war of attrition. You're, you're sitting there for, for a lot of hours between seeing deer, and then you kind of, the action tends to come in flurries. And as you're watching, um, you know, different deer come through, you have it in your mind anyway with your you know, with your scouting intel, the different deer in the area that you might like to shoot. And, you know, one of them might be your target deer. But um, as you get into that, that phase of the season, because the patterns vary so much, focusing on that one target deer gets a little bit tougher. So, but, you know, while you're there in the stand, um, obviously a lot of things that you can do uh, both help pass the time and maybe increase your odds of, of getting a buck to within range. You know, I think um, I use a lot of deer calls. Um, you know, deer, if you listen to them, they're very vocal uh, and they're particularly vocal during the rut, especially your bucks. And so I think back on a hunt I had a few years ago, 
uh, in Tennessee. I was up in the bow stand, I think it was November 2nd, and I was a little late getting into the tree, but I was hunting in a good kind of transition area. It was in a, it was in a creek bottoms. And, um, you know, I knew I was going to catch a deer moving through there most of the morning. And, and sure enough, I saw, I saw a buck cruise through the woods probably, I don't know, 100, 150 yards away. And so I just gave him a couple of grunts. And if you, if you listen to a buck walking through the, the woods, um, when he's really amped up during the rut, they're grunting just a lot of times just almost every step. And so I, I grunted a few times and sat down, got ready to have a cup of coffee, and I thought, you know, I should probably have my bow in my hand just in case. And sure enough, that deer popped up just a few seconds later. He was right in front of me, and, uh, and, and I killed him. And so using those grunts, you're not – don't worry about, especially at this time of this, the year – don't worry about spooking a deer um, with a grunt. You, you're, I've, I've almost never seen that happen. Um, so, you know, it's a very natural sound, particularly that time of year. Lean on those grunt calls. Try your doe bleats. Make the doe bleats kind of kind of curt, you know, short, and, and the grunts, you, you really can't overdo it. And then if, uh, you know, a lot of folks like to rattle, and, and I've had some pretty good success rattling. I usually do that. Um, within an hour of daylight, you know, maybe an hour after daylight, and then again an hour before dark. And it's a it's a good thing to do when you know bucks are up on their feet, they're cruising, and they're definitely looking for a fight that time of year. One of the things that, um, and these are just a couple of shed antlers, if these were my actual rattling antlers to take to the tree, I'd be cutting the brow tines off of them and, and putting a rope together. But I do prefer uh, natural antlers. I like the sound of them. I don't like great big antlers. The, the sound tends to be a little deep. I tend to like, you know, antlers of about this size, you know, from about a 110 inch deer. And one of the things that, that's really helped me with my rattling success rate, I guess my, my response rate, is I've always tried to really listen to what fighting bucks actually sound like. And there's a tendency, I think, with a lot of guys to rattle, they, they're really making a lot of commotion with just the tines and making a lot of that, that rattling sound that we all know. But if you actually listen to two deer fight, that's not really what they sound like. They lock together and they're grinding. And they grind and they grind. And you can watch two deer out in the field fighting and, and they might grind like that for an hour. You know, I've heard them. And what you hear, you really don't hear a lot of the ground grinding noise, but every now and then you'll hear those tines pop together. And I've had a lot more luck when I go to rattle by just kind of just sitting there and just grinding my rattling antlers together for a pretty long time. You know, I might do a, a 10 minute sequence. And I don't know, it seems like it sort of piques a deer's curiosity. They, they think they can hear it. Um, you know, I don't know what's going on in their head, but, but I, I've had a lot more responses like that than I have the really loud, you know, aggressive rattling sequences. So again, that, that chase phase of the rut, um, the calling, the rattling, the mock scrapes, all the things that we, that we like to see, uh, all that rut action, that classic rut action, that's, that's when it's happening. And that's that early November through about the 10th. Now, after that, um, mid-November, you know, let's say the 11th through the 20th and, and even into like Thanksgiving around where I am, um, that's what you call the, the, the tending phase or the peak rut phase. And that's actually when a lot of the breeding is going on. A lot of folks call that like the, the lockdown phase. And, and what you have there uh, is pretty simple. You know, a doe's in heat for about 72 hours. And during that time, a mature buck is not going to leave her side. And it can be a pretty tough time to sit in a deer stand because they tend to go off into a thicket, off into kind of overlook cover, um, you know, fence rows. I, I've seen lockdown bucks and does and, and dozer piles, you know, bedded up and things like that. And, you know, it's not a time where you're going to sit in a stand and see a lot of deer. But the, the thing that I like about that time of year is you can catch a really big deer with his guard down and you can, uh, you can get away with a lot um, if you're willing to be aggressive. And usually that time of year, most of your gun seasons are in. And so like last year in Tennessee, I caught a big deer middle of the morning. Actually, the farmer uh, ran into him on my, on my way to the stand. I was getting in there late that morning. And the farmer told me that he had just seen this deer uh, follow a doe across a woodlot. And it was right before Thanksgiving. And the little woodlot wasn't three acres. Well, I had a good wind in my face. I had a muzzleloader and uh, snuck in there 
I actually bumped the does going in. The buck saw me, but he wasn't going to leave those does, and he stayed with them. And I was able to end up working my way around on the ground and 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 getting a shot at that deer. And I'm not saying that's a that's a pattern you can depend on, but during that that lockdown phase, that tending phase, if you're up in a tree and let's say you look out in a CRP field and you see a big buck bedded down out there with a doe, and particularly if you're hunting with a gun, uh, that is the time, if ever there was a time, to kind of make like a mule deer hunter, climb down and do a stalk, get that wind in your face. Um, you can get away with a whole lot, and it is a, uh, it's, it's a really good time. Although the I kind of think of it as a time when like, it's sort of like a feast or famine type deal. You know, you're not seeing the numbers of deer, but your odds of killing a really big deer uh, really increase. And that's when I've killed some of my biggest deer and definitely some of our guided clients that, that late November, really even into the first part of December as a really productive time. Now, um, as you start following that to kind of wrap up the rut, you know, at that, at that point when most of the does are bred, you know, again, into November, into that first week of December on a Midwest rut timing, you got a few things going on at that point that, that, that start to – kind of conspire against you to make it tough. <clears throat> Most of your does uh, have been bred already. Uh, your gun seasons have generally been in for a few weeks. Um, that means that a lot of your big bucks are dead, and uh, those that aren't have probably been bumped around. They've probably had an encounter with a hunter. Uh, at the very least, have probably gotten wind of a hunter or seen a hunter, even if the hunter didn't see them. So there's a, there's a lot of pressure going on. And then, you know, the, the woods are really changing from fall to winter at that point. Your browse is pretty well gone. Um, even your, your picked crop fields, the stubble is, is getting cleaned up. And so that's the time of year when you really want to start looking at your late season food sources. Start keeping your eyes on those family groups of does again. Those does, after they've been bred, are going to start moving again. But the, the good thing about that time of year is you can start patterning the does again, and those bucks are still... Uh, they're, they're kind of hanging on to the glory days, so to speak. They're still going to follow those doe groups, and they're still going to be hanging around those, those doe groups. And so early December, if you can identify a good food source and you still know that there's a good buck in the area, it's still a really good time to kill them, particularly on your evening hunts, you know, around those primary food sources. So you start getting into the, you know, into the really late season after that. Um, folks talk about the secondary rut, you know, when, uh, you know, when fawns that, that weren't, uh, big enough or mature enough to be bred during the early rut, you know, might become mature enough to be bred during the, you know, the late December rut. You know, does that weren't bred the first time around, um, you know, might come back into heat during that late rut. You know, I've never seen the secondary rut as as like a defined event, like the first rut, so much as I, you know, I've come to think that 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 trickle into the rut for again, like from Thanksgiving to about December fifteenth, uh, at least in my part of the world, you might see a buck following a doe, tending a doe, searching for a doe at, at any time during that time frame. It's not going to be that excitement that you had in November, but uh, I think too many people give up, you know, at the end of that. They stop seeing as many deer in a, in a sit. Um, they stop having deer respond to, respond to calls or not seeing as much on their trail cameras. And a lot of that, I think, just goes back to, you know, the hunting pressure has caused some, sh some shift in tactics and, and the food sources have changed a little bit. So, um, I've had some really good hunts late November through mid-December, you know, whether you want to call it sort of the end of the post rut, the trickling end of the post rut, or the true secondary rut. Uh, doesn't matter to me, you know, if a big buck walks out there and he's with a doe, it's, there's, there's something ruddy going on and it, and it can make for an ideal hunt. So, you know, again, as you, as you look back over all these phases of the rut, starting with the pre-rut and going through all of them, there are a lot of tactics that really shine, you know, in different areas. I mean, it, it, again, if you're the type that to really key in on one buck and, and have a target buck, that early part is going to be your time. And, and, in, and in some ways, too, the, the late season can be your time. If your hunting style is more like mine, where you kind of like to, to play the odds and sort of use the terrain and, and knowledge of the, you know, of, of local deer patterns in conjunction with your trail camera intel um, to just kind of put yourself in a position to, to probably get a good one to, to run by. It may not be, you know, a target buck. Um, that that seeking, chasing, uh, and even into the tending and, and peak rut phases are all pretty good. Those are just times when you want to be in the deer woods from daylight to dark and putting in the hours, and then again, you know, trying the trying the deer calls and things like that. So um, that's uh, 
That's hunting the phases of the rut, according to uh, myself and Realtree contributor Josh Honeycutt and this article on Realtree.com. Certainly a lot of other good ways to do it, and uh, hope you all will weigh in and share your strategies with us too.